Um, we're here with Irving Riskin, and what we'd like to do is um, first just touch on your biography a bit. Um, a red diaper baby, right? Oh yeah, yeah. When were you born and where? I, I was born August 13th, 1918 in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and your dad was a member of the Communist Party, right? Right, in the Soviet Union. Remember, he was a member of the, I don't know if it was called the Soviet, uh, the Communist Party, but he was in opposition in the beginning, uh, as in opposition to the Tsar, the ruler of the Tsar. I, I don't know how extensive it would go, like uh, in the beginning, whether it was a, 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 a communist revolution or just that they didn't like the way the Jews were being handled. Well, he was still there in 1905, wasn't he? Yeah. For the, revo for yeah, the revolution. Yeah, he came. Mm -hmm. And what time did he, remember when he came to the U.S.? No. Uh, okay. Uh, but you were born here? Yeah, I was born here in Brooklyn. And your dad was a carpenter, right? Right. Cabinet maker carpenter? Right. And what were your earliest, and I, if I recall you're telling me also, your mom, your mom was um, much less... My, my mother was middle classish and got involved with uh, the, the Jewish theater, not that she was an actor, but that she would be a supporter of it and stuff. And what were your, your own earliest political pieces of political involvement? Did you go to some things with your father? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, he was very active in the IW. IWO, the International Workers, Workers Order, and then he was very active in the campaigns like for the uh, Scottsville boy cases, the uh, uh, Sacramento case, uh, when, when Italy uh, uh, invaded Ethiopia. He was very active in that, that, plus the fact that he, during the Depression, I said, I, I don't know the time, but sure. during the Depression, uh, they, he, he was very, very active in re, moving people back into their homes where they were. Uh, evicted, right? Evicted. He had a group of, of carpenters. He belonged actually to the, uh, what was known as the Red Logo of the, the Carpenters Party, Carpenters the Carpenters Union. Union. Right. And uh, uh, he was very active in that. And when when uh, he was he was an employee here, and in 1927, the party ruled that you can't be a member of the Communist Party and an, and an, an employer. He he gave up his business and, and just went back to work as a carpenter. It wasn't a very big business, though, right? He had a few employees. Well, uh, yeah, and number, it wasn't a number of employees, but it was quite successful because at that time, uh, a, a store was practically built from scratch. They called it the storefront industry, like uh, the uh, refrigeration cases, for example which are now manufactured in a factory, was then, that was the work of a carpenter. He would come in to see and build the refrigeration and everything in that store. 
including the front. It, it was pretty lucrative until the election really hit. So just a second, I want to continue. So our view, um, in terms of your own political activism, um, did you join uh, Communist Youth, or what, what, how did you get started in your own Communist Youth? Well, well my, my father would drag me to meetings, and uh, he, he would talk to me about it. And, but in school, uh, in, in the, the school I went to, the elementary school, uh, they had a very active staff. Many, I suspect, must, must have been communist teachers. Uh, for example, it was one of the, uh, the first school at that time to hire a Negro teacher. And he was hired as a substitute. And when his year was up, the school didn't want to renew his license. His contract, I guess. Yeah, you know, contract, whatever they called it at that time. Uh, and my father worked with a number of us uh, to keep him in uh, in the uh, teaching. Who happened? He happened to be a. Uh, his name was King, and there was a king that was a very good athletic family. The, the kids liked, we liked King because he used to play ball with us. And after school, he would work with the kids in the school. Ground. So um, when did you... So as a student, you, your, your family started getting involved and stuff. When did you personally um, start getting involved? Did, you went to a little bit of college too, right? Yeah, I, uh, two, two years of night college. At Brooklyn College? With Brooklyn. You? Brooklyn Evening. Uh, well, I, I, got, I got involved. There was a, friend, a close friend of, of my family's that worked for as an organizer for IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And it was just about the time that the CIO was developing. And uh, he, he, he proposed that the IBEW, which was the electrical part, the skilled workmen, that they organized the uh, uh, supplementary divisions that they worked in. And uh, I worked for the summers, a couple of summers, and my job was uh, to, to, to strengthen the union talk. That was one area. I remember you talking about this, but this was sort of in contradiction to the CIO organizing that was starting, correct? Well, yeah, what, what, what happened, I mean, I don't know if you went, you went to that one, but we had, we had, uh, there was a, a, a group of us that were trying to organize what we call the Sub the B, B division, the AFL at that time would have what they called A divisions. That was a skilled working men. And then they would have BF divisions, depending on what they were w working on. Like the industry I was in was fixing these complicated fixes that was in, in movies and stuff. And, and uh, I worked in that division, and we we had organized in the course of the time we had organized that division, and the A division 
would they would work and they man would would work putting on the uh, lex lexical f faucet of it, and we would do the other work to fix the work, which is the design. Well, we we called a general strike in that industry, our second year of organizing, and the AFL. Uh, the the local three people would cross our picket lines because they were working right beside our men. This was your own your own union essentially. Yes. This was IBEW people crossing your line. Right, right. Uh -huh. And and what year was this been? Uh, well, it would have to be it would have to be before 1939, Nine. maybe 38 mm -hmm. or 37. And and, and uh, when we we kept the A men out out of work, they were they were crossing our picket line, and we kept them uh, out of work. So they were very angry with us, and and, and uh, the administration. Call, uh, called a, a, a meeting where they were giving the membership false information about us. So those of us, there were four of us that were pretty active in the organization. Uh, one, one of the men uh, said he had written a telegram explaining the issue to the rank and file. And the union, who were made up of a lot of goons, went after him. And so we all agreed that we participated in the activity. And we had, I, I had to leave, basically. That was my reason for leaving the movement. So early on, you um, became well established as something of a troublemaker. Well, no, an, an activist. Yeah. But, <laughs> okay, what, so what led you to come to Washington in 1939? Well, I, I had taken a test, a, a civil service test for a messenger, and uh, I, I just practically kicked out of the union because they wouldn't give me any job. Uh, and I came to Washington in 39 as a messenger. And um, how did you start getting involved in you know, the, the union work here? And the, well, I, I was w working, for, I was part of a New Deal agency, housing agency, trying to became war housing, etc. But it was at the time of the phony uh, war period, and uh, actually there was a lot of activity around the uh, whole question of Spain and stuff. And well, Spain had been slightly. You Spain was a little earlier, actually, the Spanish Civil War. No, it, it went into all this period. Okay. It went all into the period of '39. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the uh, Abraham Lincoln Brigades. Uh, in fact, we had. We were picking it. Into, during that period, for 18 months, uh, oh, the first before that, back when I came here, the uh, press club caf at the cafeteria, and that cafeteria went out on strike, and th th that's where my wife was involved. I met her 
So my wife, uh, she used to go every day to the press cafeteria, picketing the cafeteria and organizing there. And she was, was working uh, for, who was she working for at the time? She was a volunteer for the union. The, um, the guy's name was Palmer. You may know him because he was around for quite some time. It was the Cafeteria Workers Union. It was the longest strike that time. It lasted for about 18 months. If I'm not mistaken, Paul Robeson mm. came to D.C. to speak in support of the, the strikers. He may have. Yeah. Well, so at this point, you got involved in these things. You, you were already, were you already involved in the party? Well, let me tell you about my party. Mm. I, I, I was supposed to be transferred from Brooklyn to D.C. But during that time, when I came, the first few days, there was a young man giving out a leaflet. And it was against the draft called Kiss the Boys Goodbye. And so uh, he was giving out a leaflet on 13th and F Street. And this was during the height of the war just before the draft. And a crowd was uh, in opposition to giving out the leaflet. So I. I came by, I saw him, I knew it was an anti-war leaflet, and I, I told him I would help him. So we were giving out the leaflet, there was this crowd of, of people uh, 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 heckling, heckling us and stuff. But what I didn't recognize is that the leaflet was put out by the Socialist Party. This kid was an Ipsite. And I didn't, it was against the war, and I didn't worry, worry whether it was a communist leaflet or a socialist leaflet. But what, a Spanish vet who was, a, who, who was a, a leading veteran here saw me giving out this leaflet and reported me to the, to the party. And one of the biggest things of the party was to, to work with the socialists or the, the, the top to not, guys. To not work with the socialists. So, so for a long time, my friends didn't go through. And I, I never knew this story until uh, way many years later. But I was under suspicion by the party. Mm -hmm. um, we need to. I'm, I'm under instructions to move through this somewhat, so, but let me just ask you, because um, you, later on we'll talk about your return to Washington, D.C., but what was it like to come here during the New Deal with all this going on? And what, what was it like to come to Washington, D.C.? Well, it was the most exciting period. Uh, 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 that for me, because the the union I was with, offered some professional work, workers, had just broken away and just be, become set up, and I was very active, actively involved in the union. In fact, that was my major activity was was working for the CIO union. And it was the time of the CIO, and the, the agency was doing some good work. And so it was very exciting. And, and there was plenty of union work. I mean, for example, the, the agency that I came to work for housing the messengers and the clerks were working a half hour, uh, an hour total, a week longer than the rest of the uh, workers. 
and I was able to organize the messages and we got a good start. Mm -hmm. Plus the fight, the, the, the union structure was uh, so uh, so vital. I mean, we as, as, as communists or lefties, we were fighting the uh, within our union socialist leadership, and the, it just was a tremendously exciting. Um, to move it along, again under my instructions, um, how did you? Um, under what circumstances did you then move to Detroit, and when did you go? Well, I went, I went to Detroit in 1944, um, but within the, the my work, we had, we had, uh, we were working for a guy by the name of Kaiserling, you may have heard of him. Yeah. He was the economic advisor to the, uh, to the president at that time, to Roosevelt, and he was a member of our of my union. He used to come to our union meetings, and so as a result of his influence, we were able to practically the union negotiate a sort of contract or, or understanding with with the. Uh, administration of, of the agency and we had a promotion from within policy and that program that we had was they would each year train four people messengers and clerks on the operation of the uh, the operation of the uh, of the administration, how how it functioned. You worked a few months in each category, like in in uh, uh, administration, etc. Well, I was one of people as part of this promotion from within plan, and. When my turn came up to get the job, because the understanding was when you completed this year of service, you got the first job that came up in that category. It would be equivalent to a, a professional grade at that time. Well, when my turn came up, I was, I was on a negotiating committee of the union and a vacancy appeared in the personnel division. That, that, that according to the agreement, I, I was to get that promotion. But the administration didn't want to give it to me because they said, how can we give, give a and negotiating with the union, all kinds of stories why I couldn't be. So they offered me a job in Detroit. So I went out to Detroit in an administrative capacity. Now, we didn't mention this, but by this time you and Suzanne were married, right? No, not at that time. Okay. And, we got married. I, I left six months before we got married. Ah, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Well, yeah. I, that's about it, yeah. So you, um, so you um, took a job as something of an administrator for the public housing in Detroit, right? Well, that would be my rating, yeah. I mean, as a result of the way called, yeah. And um, what were you? What were the essential things you were involved in there besides doing your job? Um, how long did you keep that job? Well, I kept that job for five years, but 
Well, you have to understand that somebody, and the situation was we had nothing in, in Detroit. I mean, we didn't have any furniture or anything. We just had actually a building. And I, I, it was my, my job to get furniture, hire lower, the lower qualified people. And we had to maintain some uh, semblance because the agency had taken the land away from Ford uh, to build the city of Willow Run, a city up from scratch, a planned community. And uh, that, that, uh, that was the work around. But, but this was the height of the uh, UAW. And uh, the UAW was, was you know, a Sabbath study, but in the councils, it was very active. There's all kinds of gradations, even within the unions, the Lutherites, the, the uh, Catholic trade unions. So it was a very exciting time. Plus, um, at that time, the Ford Local um, had just become, had one on the left. Uh, and the, the president of the union at that time was work, work with the party people and was considered a honest trade unionist, which was a title a party used to give to people who worked with them but were, were members of the party. And he, he was very much interested in a social program for the union. And, and uh, one of the things he did is he brought in a group of the of the um, uh, oh, PC is the original group. Uh, the Weavers. Pardon? The Almanac Singers. The Almanac Singers. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sis Cunningham, for example, and a few members of the Almanacs came to, the, to Detroit to help the sister put up this this. Uh, uh, cultural program, mm -hmm. and uh, by, by that time I was married, and we we became closer to the um, to the um, all the next thing is that we set up our own group, that, but the money fell through and you couldn't go ahead with it any longer. So we're, we're going to stop for one second. Okay, so we're back on Earth. So okay. um, now, when did you um, end your work for the Housing Authority? You stayed in Detroit after you left that job, right? For a while? Yeah, yeah. I, I stayed in, in uh, in Detroit until the CIO convention, I think it was 44, when he, our union was thrown out. I think 40, maybe uh, I think it was the 40, 46, 47. Yeah, convention, when they threw, uh, as a result of Ruth's uh, activity, they threw the Office of Professional Workers out of the CIO. So you were doing a lot of work in the union, despite being having this administrative job. Yeah, I, I, my you know volunteer time, but right. I was uh, 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 I did 
what what happened was very good. My boss, was a guy by the name of Rita, he was a city planner, a heck of a good guy. And when the FBI would come in and talk to him, he they he he, he would protect me with us, like, you know. Uh, but it got to a point where, where the pressure was pretty great, great from the agency that they, it was a question of whether they were going to kick me out or, or give me an opportunity to resign. So I resigned, and then I, I, I went from, and that, and that was the 46, and I went to Pennsylvania. No, but before we move you to Pennsylvania, you just told me one thing about your, um, I believe your dealings with Jimmy Hoffa. Well, the, the, uh, I, I was uh, organizer under, uh, for, for uh, six, six uh, organizations. One is the R.L. Pohl Company. Now this is why you still had your housing job? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, the, well, wait, I think, uh, no, when I was organizer for UOPWA, I had already quit the government. You already left, because, that's what yeah, I thought. You had left yeah. the government and you started working full time for the union. Right. And we had, uh, I had a plant that had uh, three, uh, three people wor working as uh, uh, truck drivers. And we had a, a closed shop agreement with that plant, but the the rival union, the Air Favelle, was raising cane with, uh, with Hoffa because Hoffa uh, didn't try and get those three guys to join his, the, the Teamsters. So Hoffa one day sent a couple of his men up and said he wanted to see me. and. I went to his office, and what, what he what he told me roughly is that this guy, the organizer for the opposition union to to ours, was raising cane because Hoffa didn't let me have three men that was in Hoffa's jurisdiction. So often said, if if I relinquish jurisdiction uh, of of the three three art jobs, he he promised not to take any more or, or raid the union or cause us any trouble. So uh, that was the agreement. Is that what you mean? What? Yeah. Yeah. And. He never, he never raided the union, and it was very important to us because if the, uh, uh, it helped us hold this shop in line, because whenever they, they would lose something, half of men would take a week to get from Baltimore to Washington of a part, you know, and suddenly they pay well. So anyway. You had already resigned your job, and you kept organizing for the union. Um, and then, after at, at the point came where that became untenable after the union was thrown yeah. out and raided. Right, right, yeah, we could. Now, had your family, had you, any of your children been born while you were still in Detroit, or did it happen in Allentown? Oh, my, my children. Well, Michael was born in Allentown. Okay, so it was a cabin. Um, so it became very hard to make a living in Detroit. Pardon? It became very hard to make a living in Detroit. 
In the train? Yeah. What? Let me rephrase it. What led you to go to move to Allentown? Well, uh, Skippy's mother, my mother-in-law, claimed that she was not well and she couldn't. They had a little business, a grocery business, and she couldn't work in it anymore. And uh, I was to go down to. Uh, um, uh, Pennsylvania to, to to take a place. But this gelled with the situation becoming very difficult in Detroit. Uh, in where? In Detroit. This this coincided with your situation becoming very difficult in Detroit, did it not? No, it didn't. It didn't become difficult until I went to Pennsylvania. Okay. Okay. So um, you moved to Pennsylvania. Right. Um, now, in addition to, did you begin working in the store, the deli grocery store? Yeah, a couple of days, but um, mostly. Ba basically, I was a salesman, so I had my own things that I was selling. I was what is known as a factory representative. I retained that, which meant I represented a couple of companies on specific items and uh, I put in a few days at the, at the store to relieve my mother-in-law. And you started doing that in Detroit? No. Okay, you started this no. there. And of course, you also, of course, became, remained very, very active in the party, in, in, in the Communist Party. In, in you mean in Central Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania? Yeah. I, what, what happened when I came in, the, uh, the party was already established, but they were thinking of moving the organizer out of Pennsylvania for some, for whatever reason, I, I don't know. And so they, they were without an organizer. And they asked me to, if I would help out in the work, and I agreed. And I became, in, in essence, the organizer for that, that area. It should be Allentown, Scranton, yeah. North Bear, that Allentown, Eastern. Uh, that whole area of, of of small cities and stuff, but what the, the, my best friend who, who developed was party member, former steel he claimed, was an FBI agent, and so for ten years. I was under complete. Con you never suspected. Yeah. No, never suspected yeah. until he came forth in a trial, which was ten years later. So, but, what what did life become like for you and your family as the uh, the Red Scare increased in Allentown? Why don't you talk about that a little bit? <gasps> What, what, what do you mean? How it was? Well, you you once told me a story that um, there was even a, a newspaper article about a plot to poison the water system. Yeah, well, this this guy testified. When, when he when he testified, he testified in the trial of the. Uh, the Pennsylvania Smith Eleven or whatever, and he he was asked by the prosecution if at any time there anybody talked about overthrowing the government, and he said yes, and he named me, 
Is that what you referring to? Yeah, I thought there was a thing about poisoning the water. Supply. That's it. That 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 we talk about overthrowing the government by by poisoning the water supply in in in, Bethes in the uh, the area there. Well, what kind of pressures came on the family? I mean, there was. FBI harassment? On, 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 on me? Yes. Well, the harassment didn't start until the guy testified. He was held undercover for the 10 years. It wasn't until the uh, trial of the Pennsylvania Six that he testified. And it became public that I was this kind of a, a person. Were you still in Allentown at that point, or had you moved to D.C.? No, I stayed in Allentown. I, I was determined not to not to run away. I stayed two years after I was exposed, and I just, you know, I couldn't work for my in-laws anymore. My in-laws were people born in Pennsylvania, in this small town, well known among the Jewish community, etc. So I, I couldn't wait for them any longer. Once I was exposed, I, mean, I had to go out on my own. Can I, can I just ask a follow-up question? Um, were you, I mean, did you have anything to do with poisoning the water? How did they get that? <laughs> no, no. Why did they, you know, and then... Well, go ahead. <laughs> when, when they couldn't anything, when they, when they would ask him a question, the stupid question, and he, he didn't have an answer right away, he only to mention my name, so it didn't matter what they asked him. My name was always thrown out. You know what I mean? No matter what question they asked him, he, he, I was always present, or always made the comment, you know. And this was a guy, he'd probably been over at your house a lot. He'd oh, he, he your... yeah, we, we lived, we were practically brothers, you know. You described him previously as your best friend. Pardon? You had described him to me as your best friend. Yeah, he was my best friend. I mean, Did he ever he, have any communication with you after that trial, ever in the years? Later? Oh, no, no, that was it. no. Yeah. no he, he ran for, after the trial, he thought he would become a politician, so he would run for various offices. Mm -hmm. but that's all. Uh, Never, never directly talked with me. Why did they decide after 10 years to, to bring this case up, to, to, to do this? Were you, were you getting more effective? Or no, it, it, no. It wasn't about, it was, they were doing the Smith Act. Yeah, you know, they, yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. Is, uh, I, I'll tell you what, what, I don't know about it, this was said, but he, the, the party, was well aware that they they had to be careful in in contacting the their various pieces. So he was like a courier for the party. They set him up in business. They bought him a car, a truck. They got customers for him, and the FBI used used him. When he would have a message, the party used him as a courier. He was the guy who would deliver the notes to, to, the, to, to uh, the, the party headquarters. He would carry the messages. He would attend meetings and stuff. Uh, when, they, when they needed a, a car, he would go to Pittsburgh and go to, to the Steel Commission meetings. So 
they used him as their courier. He, he had access to all the things that were happening in the district. And the, what happened is that we had a meeting of our of our uh, a group, a party meeting of our group, and he was to pick up some stuff in in, in Philadelphia, which was 69 miles from where we lived, and he he he, he, he was to pick up for. Uh, our educational committee, some material. Well, he, he, what he would do would go to the bookstore, get the stuff, and whatever the party secretariat uh, had, whatever instructions they had. And this day, they they had given him some material, the party, I'm trying to figure out how it worked. He, he had a letter of a meeting. The, the secretary had, had called a meeting of all of its subsidiary leadership. And they had that note he, what he would do is that he would he would uh, go to the FBI headquarters and duplicate the note, leave the wood copy in Philadelphia, and then distribute the other copies to the various uh, places. Well, he didn't have time to have the the letter duplicated, and it was a notice to our party people of, of a meeting held in Philadelphia. That's where they caught all the party people who, who were members of the secondary leadership. Now, I was supposed to get a, a copy of that letter, but because he didn't have time to to uh, have the notice duplicated in Philadelphia, he just left it there. So when he brought the material to me, I didn't know about the meeting. So that's the reason why I wasn't arrested with the other group. And Let me step back a second yeah, since uh, John gave me an okay to stay back here a little longer if we need to at this period. Um, why did you join the Communist Party in the first place? What motivated you and what was your vision of what you well, hoped to see? Well, first place was, was my, my, my father's influence. But, I mean, his was general influence. The thing that the reason I joined the party is when I looked around when I was even in elementary school, the people I saw who were active, the people who were in the fight for for better jobs for people, for getting them, putting them back in the house, uh, and, and act, things that were going on there were communists. And that was the main motive. I, I was interested in, in, in the political situation there, but uh, that that thing, plus the impetus of the teachers I had, even in elementary school, the uh, public school teachers were were, were lefties. Mm -hmm. Most I, had, of them. I had a couple of those in the '60s, actually. Was so that, but, but while you're still in Allentown, just to get a, a better idea in the record, aside from your union work, what other kind of things were you working on? Well, well that in the party. 
and so right. okay okay um, what led you you said you stayed there for two years after you were exposed what what were the kind of ways that uh, pressures were put you know um, why did it become increasingly uncomfortable and well, was the impact like on well, when, when this guy turned he had the names of every member of our, of our party in that district. And the people, the party people, because they were frightened and stuff, they would say, oh, we only knew, his name was Herman, we only knew Herman because we bought chickens from him. We only, uh, we, we didn't know of any other way and stuff, you know. They tried to absolve themselves. And unfortunately, many of the, many of the uh, people, there were very few, were really, you know, tested communist people. And they were running all over the city. For example, if they would see me walking down a street, they'd, they'd cross over. People didn't come to my house for two years. My kids, were, uh, they didn't want to have anything to do with me. And everybody was, they were frightened. It was, uh, that's the only way I could, could uh, plus the fact they didn't know if there were any other stool pigeons around. They were scared. The, the party had, the uh, FBI had really hidden their contacts, so, really, so there were a number of those kind of reasons. You told me a story once about Michael, your son Michael, your oldest child, oh, yeah. and a school trip. Right, was that yeah. in Allentown or was that already uh, Allen, in Allentown? Why don't you tell me about that? Well, he had a... What would happen in one of his teachers that he was about the third, about the third grade then, that she would announce that they're going to the fire station, you know. Well, everybody would go but Michael. Michael was, was to go to the, the um, office of the principal while it's class was at the fire station and stuff like that. Michael was very popular before before the uh, announcement, and, but the, none, none of the people would have anything to do with him after that. Just a, a kid, you know. It got so bad that that a, a man of my wife's husband who was a uh, um, a a religious man had to go to the rabbi and they had to call call a meeting of the Jewish community and the rabbi had to intervene and uh, uh, say it wasn't fair the way they were treating my son, you know, and put the pressure on. But it was it was bad. But we had what they call a, a, a split house, you know, you know, half of them. A duplex. A duplex. And the, the the party in the other duplex that we were very friendly with would have nothing to do with. And was that like this that made you go to Washington then? Was that, you can ask that question about the name. We're wrong. Okay. We're wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, state your full name for the committee. No, no, what was. <laughs> <laughs> What's your full name, Bert? I thought I'd create a little uh, environment here. <laughs> my, my full name is Ivy Griskin. No middle name. Well, I got a Jewish name, and that's the way it was filed. It's Ezekiel, and I never was able to get a, to this day, get my uh, 
birth certificate, birth certificate because the, the uh, doctor that delivered me was was drunk or something. <laughs> he put my Jewish name down. Uh, all right, since we're naming names, what what was the name of the informant, the the, one, the man who was your best friend? What was his full name? Uh, Herman Thomas. Herbert Thomas. Herman Thomas. Herman Thomas. Okay. Um, you're of course being interviewed here somewhat for two. Um, and what was Suzanne doing during this period in Allentown? In Allentown. Well, she they, they, basically she was working on the uh, Rosenberg case and working within se several meetings, but uh, specifically I'm trying to think uh, if she was a member of the party, whatever. Whatever we we activity we did, she participated in it. Uh, but mainly, uh, I think she was taking care of the kids. The Rosenberg working on the Rosenberg case must have become increasingly difficult thing to do in that political. Oh, oh, oh yes, yeah. in fact, she was she was uh, called before the Rosenberg committee. Uh, before the Un-American Committee. Well, Un-American Committee, yeah. In fact, you were, um, that's right, you were, um, you guys had to come to Washington from Allentown. You're right. Tell, yeah. tell us a little about what happened with that. Well, Suzanne was, uh, there was two occasions I came in. One was, Suzanne was called to testify before the Rosenberg Committee, and uh, I was called a little later on to testify before the uh, um, Senate Internal yeah. Security. Senate, Senate, uh, yeah. Um, when you say Rosenberg, you meant the HUAC, the Un American Activities. Yeah, Committee. right, right, yeah. And so. Um, you had been told, if I recall, when Suzanne was subpoenaed, that a lawyer was oh, arranged. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the the party told us we'll go ahead and uh, you know they'll have a lawyer waiting for us in Washington. And we were, we were in Pennsylvania at that time, and when we came here. There was no lawyer. Uh, what's his name? Uh, the Rosenberg Committee, uh, the wife of, uh, of what's his name? Was, David Ryan? Well, well David. Selma, Selma. Selma Ryan. Selma Ryan, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the Ryan, uh, David, I think, took the case over and. And, you know, but I couldn't go into the hearings because what the FBI, what they were doing at that time was if they saw somebody in the audience that they hadn't called, you know, they would pull them out of the audience and have them, and, and uh, have them. So, so they told me to stay away from the courts. And what was that like? What was that experience like for Suzanne? Well, uh, it was terrible. First place we came in, and there was no lawyer designated. There was a lawyer around. David Ryan was dealing with uh, uh, what's his name's wife, not you know, and didn't know anything about us, but. You know, he took the case. It was very frightening. Mm -hmm. The fact that I didn't have a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Where did who did you stay with when you came? Do you remember? When for the hearing. For the hearing. <clears throat> I don't remember. That's okay. Um, 
<clears throat> and this, when you were called, yeah. Also, now, so did that make headlines? Yeah. Back in Allentown. Yeah. It started all over again. Mm -hmm. Not only did it make a headline mm -hmm. of me, but it exposed the people who were exposed the first time. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, take the fifth? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that, yeah. Did they yeah. threaten you with contempt or? Uh, no, they just thing. let you take the fifth, and that's all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the uh, when when you were called, were you were you still in Allentown, or were you already living in Washington? Al Allentown. Okay. And what were the circumstances with that with the your subpoena to the Senate committee? It reopened the whole thing again. Once. W w once they called, for example, I had a series of uh, hearings and publicity would come out when, when Suzanne was called before the, the committee for the Rosenbergs, it opened up the whole uh, business. Pebbles, the names of the, all the communists that they had, and all that stuff was published again. Well, by this point, it must have been um, very difficult to be doing any sort of political work. Well, it was. That's why I came to Washington. Now, and let me ask you about that, because it would, anybody watching this video in the future may think it a bit counterintuitive <laughs> that the place you moved was the place both you and your wife had had nightmare experiences. What, what brought you to Washington? Well, I, I had been here before, and I knew a little bit about it. I had made certain contacts here, and although I worked for the government at that time, I was basically a salesman, or I had contacts here, and. When when I when I came back here, the first place when I came looking for an apartment, I couldn't get certain apartments. But then they would, Suzanne, my wife, had relatives here, and they went to all her her relatives and told them that if they uh, got involved. If, if my wife got involved with her family, or family got involved with us, they would um, they would, would face some problems, you know. Just uh, ask one question to close the chapter on Allentown. Did any of your communist comrades from Allentown area stand by you? In, during that, till they all sort of turned none, 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 yeah. none of my comrades survived me. There was one young man who was who, who was a um, a a oh, uh, what do you call it? Same sex. Um, gay? Uh, gay. He was gay. Mm -hmm. He stood, the only one who stood by me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for two years, I didn't have a, mm -hmm. anybody ever come into my house or mm -hmm. say hello to me. Yeah. Anyway, back to Washington. I just was curious about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, what did you guys, what were you feeling like when you got, when you guys got here? You knew this was the, uh, the epicenter of the storm. I mean, Belly of the beast. You know, all this stuff was going on here. The committees were still here. Were you aware of there being a more of a progressive community you'd be able to fit in, in with? Did you know any of the party or ex-party people here or anything? No, like that? I didn't know anybody. Uh, I, I knew some of the peripherally. Uh, because of this incident of my giving the, um, of, of distributing the socialist leaflet that I spoke to at the beginning, 
the, the party held me under suspicion. They uh, Bick was was the youth leader, and he would never involve me in any of the activities of the party, and never would let me know about the activities Is, of the are party. Are you talking now about yeah. 1939, or are you talking about 1950s? Well, I lived here for, for all the period that I lived here. Right. And Bick was involved with the party. You mean Leon Bick? Until the war, yeah, Leon did. Okay, but I'm saying when you, what year, you came back here in 1950. Come back here? Seven. 50, uh, 50, uh, 56. 66. Not 66, it was in the 50s. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to figure. Wait a now. Because you'd held you'd held the house you'd own, own your house for. 50 years. I came back here in in fifty seven. Uh, that was when I came from Allentown okay. to Washington. Okay. Um. So, how would you? How was Washington different, or how was it the same? You had spoken about Washington being a, a very exciting place when you were here in the late 30s. Off camera, you had talked about it being very segregated. Right. Um, and we might want to pick that up a little bit. What, what, what was different and what was the same of the Washington you came to in 1954 compared to the one you left in the early 1940s? Well, frankly, because of the way I reacted to this, some of the best years of my life was when I first came to work for the government. Uh, I liked the work. I, was, I, was, I felt pretty effective in what I was doing. Uh, when I came back in 57, I got involved in the great boycott. And I don't know how to answer that question without some deep thought, because... Okay. I, uh, well, there was civil, it was still, when you moved back, it was still segregated. Yeah, but, yeah, but it happen, was different. Right? There, yeah, there were certain things that were happening that that changed the tenor. For example, when, when I first came to, to Washington, the sense of it being a southern city was very strong, which didn't exist later on. And I was just involved in different things. Uh, I, I I was pretty much involved in the CIO here, uh, and, and uh, the formation of the CIO, and, and in my union work uh, devoted. Plus, I liked the work I was doing for the government. I liked the housing work, and uh, uh, I, I thought it was doing a good job and stuff. So you, so you came back, you came back if for, perhaps for employment opportunities or you know sales opportunities yeah, well, more yeah. than anything else. Well, yeah. And how did you wind up settling in politically, both you and Suzanne? How did you find begin finding your kindred spirits or what was left of the party or whatever was going on with that? Well, when, when I came back in 57, there was a few things, that, activities. There was no activity, really. A. Bloom played a very important role in the peace movement. The women's strike for peace was just developing and played a very active role that by Suzanne and peripherally, I, I would be working in it. 
and and uh, there were these kinds of activities. There was the shula activity. Tell tell people more about what the shula. Was. These were the basis of the progressive activity that I saw, and it was very vital. And the people that were involved in that period seemed like seasoned party people. I mean, uh, although they did have that spy, that woman that was a spy, but 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 that was. Uh, well, talk about the shula. No, well, what, well, what what was it like to know about the shula? Well, to explain what it was, it was, it was a Sunday school, yeah, a progressive, non-Jewish, Jewish, yeah, Jewish yeah, Sunday school. Yeah, it was cultural, right? And the. Uh, the teachers were the members of the left community. We, we did a, a lot of work, work with the African-American community. We would hold joint meetings with them on education of children. And we would teach Jewish cultural his, history. Mm -hmm. it, and it played, a, 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 at that time, that period of time, it was really one of the, the only left-wing organization of, uh, it was one of the few, uh, at school itself, the building was on the FBI list. Uh, and it had a very consistent following. And the people, a lot of those people were involved in whatever activity, progressive activity was taking place at that time. Where was the Shua? It was on Georgia, Georgia Avenue, I think. It was right now. Pardon? I'm sorry, Georgia and... In the district? Yeah. And it was an old uh, house, you know. Uh, and uh, for years, you know, existed. It was set up, I think, uh, Ruth Pinkston's had a lot to do with it. Ruth, Ruth, I think you know Ruth. And Does that last up into the 1960s? Uh, did the Shula last into the into the 60s? Uh? It, it lasted when when uh, there was a point at which the the government insisted on taking over the uh, some of the uh, facilities of the of the party. Uh, they, it confiscated them. Mm -hmm. And then, was this building owned by the party in some way? The, I, I think by the IWO. Oh. We should say for the record, because you mentioned your father in the IWO, it was the International Workers' Order, right. which was a burial and benefits society, and well, more. Well, it was more than that, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, in we're gonna stop for one second. Okay. Um, what was th what were the interactions like between you and these other left activists? There was was there any real party organization at this point? It, oh, oh yeah, yeah, there was. Yeah, guy by the name of Jackson uh, for a while held up, uh, and I can't. Maurice. Is that Maurice Jackson? Pardon? Maurice Jackson, was that? Or? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's later, though. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's later. later. Was, yeah. yeah. Like Hudson Wells and stuff like that. I mean, was, was there still... Well, Hudson Wells was there right from the beginning, right. as far as I know, yeah. But I mean, in the early, in 57, when you were here, was there any sort of functioning organization? Did you consider yourself a member still? Yeah, but, but I, as I said, I was kind of under suspicion of Even the then. party, yeah. Well, that was a period in which people would work, work with me, but 
the party leadership just wouldn't, uh, they were just suspicious because at the, at the uh, arrest of the, of what we called the Pennsylvania Six, I was supposed to be at that meeting and I wasn't there and I didn't know anything about it. My wife was told by one of the members after we were married, 10 years after. So, and then the fact that I was giving out those leaflets, mm -hmm. uh, then I was under suspicion. How did it work for um, Michael and Karen here in making the transition to DC? Did it become less, considerably less of a hostile environment for them? You know, they, I, I think from Michael's point, point of view, Karen, Karen was not old enough to uh, really understand what was taking place at that, you know, during the time. Michael got the brunt of the attack against the ch children. And I think as a result of that, he, he's not a joiner. He may have uh, good intentions, but he, he doesn't join any organization. No, I know, but I meant back then, did it feel more comfortable and hospitable and easier to make friends again in the new, in the new place? in D.C.? No, no, because we were a very short time, time after, after the thing broke, I, it was only about two, hours, two years remaining in the, uh, in, in Allentown. Right. And so... Uh, no, but I'm speaking much. about after, once you came to Washington. But the Washington was it, much, was it better for the kids? Oh yeah, sure. They made friends right away. Michael made very close, close friends, mm -hmm. and Karen, Karen just seemed to work it out. Plus the fact they um, they both became involved during that period. There was the Gladen, which was a uh, a very interesting place. It was a, a summer camp and and school, and it was organized by a Quaker wo woman who refused to take the oath mm -hmm. that the required oath, the loyalty oath, loyalty oath, and she was fired. Then she set up the this Camp Gladen, which was one of the first interracial camps in Virginia. And it was a good experience because both of my kids taught there and uh, most of the people there were, were progressive kids. The teachers were progressive. It was a very good experience. And so, I can't remember him really facing any real problems with friendships. Well, now that we have you in Washington, D.C. in 1957, in um, the late 1950s, some stirrings are starting to happen. There's concern about the nuclear testing, as you talked about. The uh, beginnings of the civil rights movement, um, et cetera, et cetera, and a lot more was about to start happening. But let's pause for a second. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine, you know, we, people talked about um, sort of a lost generation and the, the uh, complacency of the 50s. For some people who had this passion burning for social justice, the awakenings must have been incredible to uh, find movements to be involved in again um, that were growing and vibrant. 
why don't you talk a little bit, just as an overview now, of the things you uh, started getting involved in here in the late 50s and 60s? I don't understand your well, question, what, 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 what did you do here on the left? You know, what type of activities did you get involved oh, in as, here? as everything well, started? Well, it, basically, during the Great Boycott, I was quite active in the Great Boycott. Now that started in 1960. 60s. 60s. Mid yeah, mid 60s. Yeah. And, and uh, 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 we used to have uh, a uh, boycott house here, and they had a vice president of the Great Workers Union here, and I, I used to work very cl closely with them, uh, and they they worked very closely with Mrs. Uh, with uh, Ethel um, Pardon Kennedy. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. she would help me raise money, mm -hmm. and uh, I would be on picket. We set up a uh, great workers committee here. That was a major now, even activity. Before that, you started getting involved in any war things, did you not? Pardon? Even before? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. oh yeah, if that's the sequence of time, I I I worked with the uh, peace movement uh, and mostly the Great Panthers. Mm -hmm. Oh, seventy two was the Great Panthers, and, but uh, and the CIO activities here, union activities, union. Union activities was my concentration. Uh, but there was not a lot of that here to be involved in. No, no but in, there was, you know, bouncing off from that, there was, for example, there was a very famous case called Helen Miller case. Uh, uh, she was a, a union person that was being fired by the government because of a leftist activity, and uh, that was one of the major fights of the CIO union. Um, there also was a time when the, the youth movement split. Uh, I think I was. A, Mrs. Roosevelt uh, had brought together. Uh, well, we're, we're back. We're back. We're back a little earlier. Yeah. American Youth Congress and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Back yeah. Up in the in the late fifties and early sixties, um, there was you mentioned Suzanne got very involved in the women's strike, for the family. Yeah. Right. Strike. Right. Right. That was that was part of that. Um, and that got related to some of the UAC hearings as well, right? The women's strike, yeah, uh, yeah. and yeah. how they handled that. Um, there were just various anti-war organizations that developed and various activities that you got involved in. Yeah, yeah uh, there was a lot around the Rosenberg case. Uh, Still right. Sure. We did hear you know. Uh, and the committee to reopen the uh, right, Yeah. The, but it was not the same degree of activity as, for example, in the union movement. Right. And I would throw myself into that. That's right. Did, did you uh, get involved at all in the Giles Brothers case? To what? The Giles Brothers case. The Giles the Johnson. County, Giles Johnson. Not, this was like yeah. a Scottsboro boy yeah. type case in Montgomery County. That's slightly, yeah. that wasn't, slightly uh, earlier, actually. Well, those no, early 60s. No, I know I didn't get too involved with that. Yeah, just just. Was I don't know. Yeah. yeah, it was a Joe, it was a Joe Ford case. Yeah, but um, just to meant to touch base on some of the stuff. You also got very involved in the the forming of the Silver Stream Co-op, right? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, I uh, I was one of the founders of the uh, Bethesda Co-op. 
Yeah. Uh, played a major role in that. You lived in D.C. and then moved to Bethesda, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I lived all my life since since 57 in Bethesda. In Bethesda, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, of course, just touching on some of these big things, besides the farm workers and the anti-war movement and the food co-op, the there became, well, before that, the, the Pressman strike, right. Right, the Alliance yeah. for Labor and Community Action, right. the Rainbow Coalition right. here in Montgomery County. Um, 1199? Pardon? 1199? No. The, the nurses strike at GW? Mm. Well, there was a nurses strike at the Washington Hospital. I, I, I was involved in the nurses strike. I used to go every day to the first strike. Mm -hmm. At the hospital at, center? At the know? hospital center. Oh. For the, I was being considered as an organizer uh -huh. for, the, for the nurses. But what uh, year was that? pardon. What year was that? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I can't remember. It's, uh, but it's late seventies. Um, but late but the first and and I came back later on twenty five years later or whatever mm -hmm. for the second strike they had picketing yeah. situation. <laughs> right, we we rolled out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that's. Uh, and then, of course, the Grey Panthers were your own yeah, right, huge right, activity. Right. Very big. Very big. More in the 80s. Yeah. 80s well, and that was founded in 70, 72. 72. And it was very active right from the beginning. Right. With 92. And we, we set up. Yeah. We, we were the founders in uh, Bethesda. Uh -huh. uh, there, was a, there was a group of three or four, four people who consider themselves great Panthers, but they weren't doing anything, so mm -hmm. we set up. And, and that was very hectic. We, we, we attracted a, a good many of the leftists right. in setting that committee up. We're rolling. Oh, wait, uh, maybe the hat. I, I like the hat, but it blocks your eyes. You ain't talking to me? Yeah. No. <laughs> You're the only one with a hat. Are you getting tired? What? You getting tired? No, no, I'm fine. Yeah. Good, because the public going. wants us. Yeah. Public, yeah. <laughs> or else how are they going to trust you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're rolling in. We're rolling. Okay, this is Irv Riskin. Uh, we're interviewing him about the 60s and the 70s. Um, Irv, we just we just left off at. Uh, the late 50s when you and your wife and your children had moved to Washington right. and uh, you got settled into Washington, you were working for the government, you had some, some you had a lot of activities going on mm -hmm. in your own political not, life. Not working for the government. Not, not working for the government. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Can you say HUD? I mean, in, 19, in 1939. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, start that again. We won't do that. I'm sorry. Okay, I got that wrong. You were working. You were. You had moved to Washington, relocated to right. Washington, and uh, it was the early '60s and the late '50s, and the civil rights movement was just starting to make some noise, and uh, there was a lot of excitement in D.C. Um, so I want to ask you of the things that you did through the '60s. For instance, you, you named two of the things that you that you felt were the most important were. Um, the Great Panthers, the work you did with the Great Panthers, and the Great Boycott, which you worked for right, for right. five years. So let's yeah. talk about the Great Boycott, how you got interested in a bunch of farm workers in California striking. What made you, what made you get interested in this struggle? And what did you do? What, how did you start it? Well, uh, it's hard to answer a question like that because I, I saw the. It's just a continuation of union activities and, and the specific thing that it was, you know. I, I never analyzed why I got into that particular area of work. I, I just felt that there was a need to support the, the, the grape workers and uh, that, that 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 was the important thing that had to be done at that time. That was the only way I could answer that question. 
Well, the, uh, the grape strike, the grape worker strike didn't become really national news until the late 60s, but you were in as early as 1965 when they did the first march. And I'm wondering, did you hear about that through your other labor activities, or is it something you heard Yeah, I, I, I don't remember when they opened up Boycott House here. It was later 60s, yeah. But, you know, uh, and exactly how I got involved, except I knew there was a grape strike, and it's something I was concerned about. I, I, I don't know how to answer that otherwise. Well, what was your first activity with the Great Boycott? Were you on one of the picket lines around the stores? Were you trying to open the Boycott House? How did you get started? Well, the first, the first activity, I think, was the um, uh, distribution of, uh, of leaflets concerning the strike. That's how I met Fred, for example. I met Fred giving out leaflets about the, the, the great boycott and the, and the fact that there was a uh, 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 moratorium on, on eating the grapes. Uh, and, and, and just and with no specific action or specific thing that, that got me involved, as far as I remember. But they did have a representative here. They had a vice president. Yeah, I don't know what, what stage he came in. That was Manuel Vasquez, right? Pardon? Manuel Vasquez. That was his name. I, I, I really forget. Yeah, he, he lived here in Washington for a while. And yeah. yeah. The, the, and he, he brought his wife here. On, on oh, the great well, that was Jean Batillier. Yeah. The Reverend Eugene Batillier. Yeah. He was the lobbyist, and they had an office there. And Manuel Vasquez was the farm worker. And, and that's how. Right. They did constant lobbying, had an office at the Methodist building. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know how. Where's the boycott house located? There, uh, it was on uh, in Silver Spring. Uh, Right. That major street that goes through, uh, mm -hmm. and had a, a, a house, and a, a, they brought a staff up here, and uh, a, about uh, a, a dozen uh, of, of the strikers from, from uh, what I call it, paid them five dollars a week and their food and board. And they showed up at so many grocery stores picketing. Yes. They were very, they were very faithful and loyal pe people. And I saw you in one of those picket lines many years ago. Yeah. Well, uh, in Montgomery County at a giant store. One of the things we used to do is we'd order a lot of food. And when it came to pay it, we'd leave the store. But. Well, it wasn't just food. It was frozen food, remember? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, everything. You fill your cart with frozen, <coughs> with frozen food was the strategy. And then you put a few grapes on top, on top of them when yeah. you get to the register. And they start to, mm. they start to add it up. You look and you, and you look at the leaflet that someone's giving you. Say, I can't uh, buy grapes that are yeah. scab grapes. I'm going to leave my whole order here. So you need a frozen turkey and some ice cream. Uh, and, and, and it was picketing of the... Yeah. Some of the, the uh, heavy uh, retailers of, uh, of uh, wines on Connecticut Avenue. We, in fact, one of our at one time our pickers were beaten up by the owners of the store. Jesus. And we had we had a nice little committee working here of middle class. Uh, people mostly. That was Gallo wine, wasn't it? Was Gallo yeah, Gallo. Wine 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 right. And Booze and Farm. And there's, there's a couple. Yeah, you ever meet the, the Joneses? They were 
They they are singers. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Peter Jones and his brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They used to come out and work with us on it. And they wrote a song, Gallo. Peter wrote a song about Gallo. You've got, to take, that you bottle, you've got to take that bottle back. <laughs> that one was. Do you remember the song? Can you tell us the words to it? I, no, I can't remember, but friends and those stuff was just. I see. I, I, well, I can remember just a little. Um, Boone's Farm, mm -hmm. it's a gallo one, well, you got to take that bottle back. back. I don't, that's the tune, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. well, they, they wrote a couple of songs, yeah. And, and there was big activities, they, they used to play um, the national anthem of, of the... Uh, uh, what, what, what's the national anthem? Uh, but uh, I can't. They're colors. Yeah, they colors. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. That was yeah. The song that everybody sang. The yeah. Day, but was there also a symbolic um, throwing blood on the grapes too? Wasn't there some of that? that uh, yeah, that was a Britain Dillon. Uh, yeah. yeah. A la, you know, draft board. Throwing blood on. But I think, yeah, I think Brent and others did do that. Yeah. Blood on the grapes. Yeah. We, we had an active group. In fact, the, the successor to Chavez, who's now, now the president, he, he came up and stayed here for a while. Right. His son-in-law, Chavez's son-in-law. And Dolores Huerta, the vice president of the union, came quite often. Do you remember her? Yeah, yeah sure. She testified. Yeah. She, she seems to be more in the legislative track. Yeah, yeah. She was the person that they usually sent to testify for she, things, and yeah. whenever Dolores came, there was some she, she, she did a lot, a lot of negotiations. A lot of negotiations. Of them, yeah. She also had always, always a big party. She wanted to see everybody, and everybody came to see her. They were great people, the big, the great workers. They were. Her, to, how much did you try to reach out to organize labor here while you were? It was obviously a, always a goal of yours. Mm -hmm. Well, we we tried, but got very little successful success in that. Uh, the what what we did is a lot of times we tried to raise money from the AFL CIO and get them get the, the members to hold fundraisers for the farm workers. And sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't. But the biggest support that we had was the Kennedy woman. Yeah. She would she would uh, raise money, and there was a group of of uh, not, uh, not nuns, but the brothers, Catholic brothers, that were very active in the defense here. They. They um, took vows of vows of uh, of poverty, mm -hmm. uh, and they were terrific supporters. They the, there's a big Catholic ch church on uh, Wisco Wisconsin Avenue. It's one of the leading churches here, and these brothers would go in when they had collections and. Uh, Insist that the church give the money to poor people, not not uh, collect it for their for their safeguard. It was a very exciting period. Mm -hmm. uh, at least for me, it there. was exciting. Yes, yes. Well, I, I, one of the things that I remember from the Great Boycott is how much we all learned about what it was like to be a farm worker. But in turn, the farm workers that worked, at least on the East Coast, turned up in mass for all the big peace demonstrations because they learned from the people they were working with that it was important to link those two struggles together. So I remember during the great mobilization in 1969 when 500,000 people came to Washington or something like that, we had the whole, in our house on Church Street, we had 40 farm workers who stayed yeah. with us, right? We kept a pot of beans going all night, and we all marched off to the march the next day, and, and they were very supportive yeah. about the war. 
you know, the anti-war movement. They understood that. They were great people. They were terrific people. Yeah. This. Well, anything else about the great boycott you wanted to leave us a thought with? Uh, well, that, that's uh, all I can remember off here. Maybe later on, I'll miss. I, do you I think uh, the lasting result of the success of the Great Boycott has been, I mean, what do you see, the goods and the bads that came from that? Uh, uh, what lasting results? Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I just don't know of any organized results. See, I think the union got enmeshed in its own problems mm -hmm. and that it destroyed uh, a lot. But, you know, uh, I, have you, do you know Paul Pumphrey? I, I, yeah, I, I don't know personally. Paul, Paul Pumphrey yeah. was connected with the, not the great workers, but a Florida uh, group that was being organized. The migrant workers. Yeah, yeah. and he he did have a uh, a lot of uh, contact with the great workers because they were like working together. And he may be able to add a few inches in that period because. Uh, 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 that's the only one I know of that has had contact that's still around. Mm -hmm. Contact. Uh, plus, uh, Carl Golden, Carl is a union organized here in town. And I met him at the uh, uh, house, uh, the, the boycott house, and he was being considered as an uh, uh, organizer for the great workers, but it, he, they only were paying $5 a week, and he, he couldn't accept it at that time. It was the beginning of his career, but uh, he may be able to add, because he came from a different perspective than, than, than I did, a different area of work. I remember him as a 16-year-old. Pardon? I remember him as a 16-year-old with the farm workers. He was yeah. very young then. Yeah, yeah. He, he, as I say, it was just the beginning of his career. And uh, since then, but he's now a union organizer. He may, I don't know how much he knows about it because I, I met him later in the, the work of the committee. But he was being considered as an organizer for the great work as so. Well, let's move into one of your other big activities in the 60s and 70s. It must have been the 70s mostly. Um, the Great Panthers. Uh, Maggie Kuhn started the Great Panthers right. here. Um, and she gave the organization at its beginning two missions. Um, the first one was to stop the Vietnam War, and the second one was to eliminate mandatory retirement because she was mad that she had to leave her job at 65. And then soon after that, you got together with her and you started making it a big organization with more issues, correct? Yeah. Lots more issues. Yeah. Well, so how did we, you get started with that? Well, we, we, we were taking at that time, Social Security was mentioned a lot in an attempt to really modify it. And that was our big issue with Social Security. Uh, plus the organization of the elderly, there was not, nothing available, but the, uh, there was a, one or two organizations among you, uh, government workers, but the only other organization was a conservative organization, um, the 
uh, that, that uh, I can't think of the name right now, but AARP. AARP, yeah. So, yeah. so we uh, count the balance for them. But the big issue then was the modification of Social Security. If you remember, that's when they, they had a uh, uh, they they had they uh, brought the com committee together to modify f Social Security, which they did. They recalculated the yeah, formula. The, the, right. Yeah. And, and uh, Maggie Kuhn was thrown out of the hearing. Uh, that was a big activity on our part. But. Unfortunately, like like the farm workers union, mm -hmm. they were they were rather than being really built organizationally, they were a uh, medium. The media, as soon as the, the press refused to give them any publicity, they disappeared. They were media. We didn't have the we didn't have the body of organization, unfortunately. So that now the Great Panthers is just actually just a name only. That's all. But with the the fight to um, save Social Security and you know ha have it modified to the public's favor, was that something that you felt how influenced the? Uh, what, what happened? Did it help? Yeah, uh, we, if you remember, there was about 10 years ago or more, there was a modification of Social Security. And we played an important role at that time. Yeah. Uh, that was back in the 1980s. Pardon? That was in the 1980s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 80s. Okay, so that was later. Yeah. But you, you feel that, that, that your work on Social Security with Great Panthers really did have an effect. Then. You're right, yeah. Well, yeah. Or even Montgomery County, you all took on some other issues concerning uh, mm -hmm. things that are impacting seniors, right? With county services and things well, like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, we just didn't stay with Social Security, but that was our main issue that we could unite the country around the issue of Social Security. And I, one of the things you used to talk about was, frankly, the Grey Panthers dying off. That That's a certain yeah. generation of right. people became its core activists, people like you, That's to right. some degree. And they weren't replenished that's right. by the next generation. That, that's right. That's one thing, for example. But it's my personal thing, but A. Bloom which was, uh, w w was ahead of the, uh, the Grey Panthers for 25 years. One of my major uh, disagreements with him was over the fact that he was for 25 years the head of the organization and there was no developing new people to come along to take it the place of, of our older generation. And I, I thought that we should do something about that aspect of our work. But uh, that's the thing, for example, one of the things that, that, that I, I, I propose is that we work, work with the children of Grey Panthers because they were approaching the, the years when they were, were retired. And we didn't have any involvement of, of our own children in the activities. And we were pressing for those, but we could never get any, any uh, real feeling on the part of the memberships to do that kind of activity. So the lessons didn't all get passed on. That's one of the things that we're hoping to do with the 60s project is to 
mm -hmm. learn some of those lessons for the next generations, like what did we do right and, and what didn't we think of that, that might have passed these lessons on better. So that's pretty important. <laughs> Especially an organization with much older people. Yeah. Yeah, and there was no understanding. For example, I was being considered for for working with some CIO unions on their retired people. The unions have a, a whole list of retired retired people that should really be involved in supporting of, the, of Social Security and stuff like that. Uh, and we can never convince the unions to really put the time and effort and money that, in, in developing that aspect of, the, of their work. And as a result, you know, uh, the activities, whatever, happened to seniors was a lot due to the fact that he was this group of large group groups of of uh, retired people without any leadership mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, that that was the area in which we were going but but then the great Panthers took uh, up different issues. For example, there, in 72, there was no teaching medical hospital that, that raised the issue of uh, uh, medicine for the elderly, you know, uh, I forget what they call geriatric. it, geriatric medicine. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, we, Maggie Kuhn would raise, for example, she would, she would uh, go out on a speaking engagement. And at that time I was acting organizational director for, uh, for, for the Great Panthers. And I would go with her and she would talk about to freshmen in classes of doctors about geriatric medicine and the necessity for it. And then after she got through, I would try and put the, the group together to, to form a chapter. And that was a, a good part of our work for a while. Uh, but, but it was never successful. We'll switch over to the. Uh, sure, we could. Uh, okay, we'll go switch seats here. Uh, oh, right there. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is, is that what you wanted? Yes. I mean, yeah. yes. I just want to hear what you say. Uh, everybody, I guess we're going to talk a little about the uh, Washington Post strike which was really where I first met you. I, I know Debbie had met you what? before then, my wife Debbie uh, Parker then. Uh, and uh, of course the strike at the Post uh, started on October 1st, 1975. I assume you heard about it right away. How did you get involved? Who did you contact? Did you contact Jim Dugan? Did you? No, I, I am. I, I think my contact with Fred is Fred a little yeah. 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 And uh, what did you, uh, uh, yeah, actually I don't know, I know Fred's involvement in the strike at that point. What was, were you involved at that point? Or, yeah, it was just, any, anyway, uh, you, you got involved uh, immediately in uh, strike support activities. Uh, right, what, yeah. What do you recall from that earlier that early in the strike, uh, what you what you were hoping to see, what you were trying to do. Uh, well, uh, it, the, the basis it was it was the union f struggle, and that's what what attracted me to it. But then I was very much impressed with the way Fred was handling the group, 
there was such divergent people there. You know, there was there was communists, four or five different bands of communism was there. There was uh, the a, a couple other labor groups, all you know, fighting each other, and through all this, Fred was handling it so that nothing erupted into anything that was serious. I mean, it, 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 the thing, I remember one thing that very clearly, the vice president of, of the union came to me one day. He said, who are the real communists here? He says, I hear you say one thing and this guy said, and you, you all consider yourselves communists, but you're all fighting in different ways. Yeah. And this, that's this, the I way it was. I was on the, uh, whatever you call it, publicity committee or something, and we had a meeting where, but somehow all the factions were represented on the committee, and sometimes it would get into that. There was a socialist workers party, the communist party. Right. right. I always forget what this is, workers, vanguard, workers, whatever it is. And um, Chip Berlay was head of the committee, and he'd say, look, this is all well and good, but we've got to get out of pamphlet, not discuss the uh, issues of the day. And I still remember once the Socialist Workers Party guy left. He was particularly difficult at times. And the, the, the communist guy said, well, now I understand why Trotsky got an ice pick in his head. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you're right. And it was, uh, I, I didn't, Chip was very good at maneuvering around that. It didn't become a big issue there either in that committee. Uh, so yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, so that was a... Uh, well, Jim Ingram was the man you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and this may have come up <clears throat> during a march when Jim Dugan, the president of the union, was explaining that, you know, Ingram asked him, well, why some communists get to mar march up front and other communists get stuck in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was trying to have Dugan and I guess Irv try to explain to him which were the good communists <laughs> which were the bad communists since everybody seemed to the Alliance for Labor and Community Action, yes. which was the main vehicle for strike support, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. along with later, and, and, and I came in more with the Defense Committee, mm -hmm. when the people got indicted. Yeah. That was my um, main entrance into the strike. This, you know, and I'm going to ask Jim Dugan about this later, but as you referred to the strike support uh, committee, a defense committee, uh, right in the midst of this intense labor dispute, the U.S. Attorney's Office announces he's investigating a conspiracy to destroy the Washington Post, or some such <laughs> terminology as that, and all the um, union members, 90-some, eventually got hauled up for a grand jury. Just from your experience in the labor movement, what sort of effect does this have on on a union's ability to wage a strike, on its morale. On can, can we stop one second? Yeah, sure. I, I think as Roosevelt said, the thing that you have to, in these situations, deal with more than anything else is fear itself. People get afraid. I mean, and they, in many cases, they go even. Uh, the, the fear is so great, and you can see, although one thing that impressed me about the pressmen is their, the way they were devoted to the union. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, expressed by one of the members who said, my, this is my union, if they tell me to, to go to, to Africa, that's where I'll go, you know. The, the feeling for the union was so great, and, and I, I thought that was very, very, very good. And I thought that the people that participated in, in that strike were, were really understood unionism and, and why they were where they were. And, and I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. In, in, in other areas that I work, that kind of feeling for the union. What were some of the specific things you were involved with in the strike? I know you'd mentioned off 
camera, the boycott issues. Tell us a little bit about what all you personally... Uh, you mean within the strike? Within the strike, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I worked closely with this guy from the, uh, the Times. Uh, the and, pardon? The Washington Star. The Washington Star, right. That, that in, in Annapolis, mm -hmm. uh, he, he was wor working on getting the, uh, uh, a, a resolution passed supporting the strike, which he did get. And I, I was working with him at that point. The other thing is that I was busy trying to organize a committee in Maryland that was support committee so that we can, could uh, uh, boycott the paper and, and uh, get the people not to, to, to cancel their subscription. And I spent a lot of time in that area which meant trying to involve the uh, other unions that were involved. And you organized car caravans also, didn't you? Pardon? Car caravans? Yeah, we, we, we you know, that, but that was like a single activity. We did, we did the activity and that was that. I think we had two caravans over the period of time. The um, so the uh, boycott uh, activities. I, I remember the various uh, meetings. I know you presided over a lot of the, the meetings too. Kept uh, uh, the support meetings um, both before the indictments and uh, I'm not sure about after afterward. Or not. Um, just wondering, do you remember many people from those days? I know you said you're not great on names, but you. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I remember some of them, but I couldn't name them. Uh, but, uh, so you mean you worked a lot with a guy from, uh, from the Star? The, he, yeah, well, well uh, and, and as a result, too, be, uh, I knew some of the, there was a, a guy, he later was a painter for the, the local from Washington. He, he did painting on the side, uh, but Zarbo. Yeah. yeah. But but uh, actually, uh, as I remember my work, all I did was talking to people and trying to get them interested in the strike. I don't know. If I raised any money for this, for the strike, I may have had a fundraiser maybe at the house or something, but I don't remember those details. Yeah, I have a great recollection of that too. Did, did, I know my wife Debbie uh, recalls very fondly uh, picketing Catherine Graham's house. Yeah, yeah. Any incidents, people passing by, neighbors, anything, uh, any stories from from that picketing? See, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't, but I know it was a favorable response and and uh, that, that that the neighbors would pick up the material we handed out, the leaflet, mm -hmm. and some would come and on the whole I felt there was a favorable response, but that's about all I can say. You know, the the strike slogan on their posters and stuff had a certain continuity for you because it the slogan was no grape, no lettuce, no post. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no grape, yes. no lettuce, no post. That's okay. right. I Very forgot good. about that. Yeah. Now, um, so um, these, uh, so yes. were there any other, and you attended, I suppose, all various rallies and meetings and that uh, too at that, at that time. Yeah, but there they weren't that many that I remember. There were, there were some, but not that many. There was one in front of the uh, post, I remember. I know yeah, I remember. Oh yeah, there was a, yeah. a big one in front of the post. But and then some church, we had a big 
a couple of big rallies that I remember. Yeah, but, but I, I was, I was just a member participating. I was I had nothing to do with the uh, organization of those meetings. You know what I mean? I just was. Uh, I, I just went. That's all you know. The, the the committee I worked with was was mostly an attempt to try and get the merchants that were handling the wine to stop handling the wine. You mentioned uh, this part of the boycott effort. You, you said you talked to a lot of local unions. Right. Their support. Do you remember some of those unions? He, the, yeah, yeah. Were there. Well, now you remember you're back. You're on the pressman strike, press and not the, not the farm workers. Not no, the no, the pressman strike. Yeah. I remember in Montgomery County the musicians' union local, and uh, there was an, another local that participated mm -hmm. uh, with us. Uh, and and a, a couple of well, uh, I think there was one or two you, uh, government government uh, unions mm -hmm. that would help. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, then for example, we knew the union in uh, Maryland University, but. I don't know if he ever took any action on uh, getting them to support thing, mm -hmm. but the important thing is we got uh, people, and and Carl. I mentioned Carl because he did have he 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 was very successful in, in getting the Kaufman Press, which was the press that was putting out the paper somewhere, mm -hmm. or had something to do with the paper, where. We got them to reduce, to cancel their subscriptions to the post. This was Carl Goldman? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Carl yeah. Goldman, yeah. Right, right, right. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Jim Dugan said that you continued to boycott the press for, I mean, the Washington Post for. He's still forever. He's still <laughs> yeah. Hey. I have it at the of my house. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The three thing you wanted to uh, ask him about. Um, yeah, I mean, from from that, of course, when the final offer came down, the Post said they were going to be bringing in uh, scabs. Uh, pressman voted down the final offer, something like two hundred and fifty to to six. I mean, here's here's a group of uh, men facing the loss of their, their jobs and yet they vote to reject this. Uh, I mean, what kind of courage or foolhardiness does it take to do that? I mean, how, do you perfectly understand that? What, what they did? Was that, was that the right thing to do? It's a tough question I've always wrestled with too, I think. Uh, well, they, they I, I was asked to, for some reason to talk. There was a, a Negro woman who was a reporter with very good standing and, and I think was, was, uh, she was a reporter and she was a friend of one of the one of the uh, uh, pressmen that was supposed to have been been beaten up by the strikers. Oh yeah, yeah. Before, yeah. yeah. Well, the, I I mean, mean, Jules Whitcover. Well, there was a foreman that was beaten up too, named Hoyer. There, yeah. I I don't know. Allegedly. This this woman was a reporter, and she was uh, well known and considered to be progressive. Mm -hmm. I can't think of the name. Was she a post reporter? Pardon? A post reporter? Or an a po a reporter? She there was a post or a star, I'm not sure. But she, oh. you don't mean Mary McGrory, do you? Yeah. Oh, 
She's yeah. not African American though, but Pardon? She's not Afri she wasn't African American, but Mary McGrory, the cop. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, and, and, for, and for some for for some reason they asked me to, to, to talk to her. Maybe I was calling the office or something. And she said that she she wouldn't possibly be in support of the strike, but the the uh, a friend of hers who was a reporter was beaten up by a so-called striker, and therefore she was not going to give the. Uh, yeah, this is familiar. Yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, Jules uh, Whitcover, yeah, that's two years. Was the reporter, but and I I think I remember you telling me that story before, but I can't remember who the who the columnist or writer was. Quite a bit. That's that's probably. Yeah. That, that, that that's uh, actually I I wasn't dealing with the strikers on any level except these these guys from the star that I was that happened to be wor working with and only because we were trying to get the uh, the the people from the from uh, the uh, the legislature to support the strike and. and in fact, the 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 priest uh, who had the area in charge of the area actually for a while was supporting the strikers, but then uh, he too claimed that he 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 was against the violence and he withdrew his name. Post, so I mean, here is the case of the post being the major uh, source of the quote-unquote news of the strike and, and the you know, vastly overstating of what went on that night, as we well know. Um, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. But it was a great propaganda to all. Oh, I'm for the strike, but it was that violence. Irving, do you remember um, the night the premiere of All the President's Men? Uh, yes. At the Kennedy yeah. Center? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember. I just remember that. Uh, uh, of gathering in the in the lobby of the theater, and uh, uh, at a certain point, I forget just what happened, but the the strikers all shouted and stuff like that. And it's vague, vague, but I remember the meeting. Then we got isolated uh, a block or so away, right? Is that I was outside. Yeah, and there were um, there were yeah. maybe my memory's punctured, but I think there were five hundred people there. Oh yeah, and it was it very was, good. Uh, it was very yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, um, I remember it was a very tense meeting because. They didn't know just how the how the the, the people would react, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't know. I can't remember anything else from that period. Yeah, we've taken up a lot of your time. It's been fascinating. <laughs> Let me ask you so, two more things related to this, though. One is, well, how did you feel, you know, finally with, during the whole um, the indictments of 15 strikers and one of them, Eugene O'Sullivan, facing potentially 40 years in jail with seven, six or seven felony indictments? Mm -hmm. The way it finally worked out, where um, you know, um, a couple of guys did time in a halfway house and. The, the Whitcover assault was separate, but yeah. that they um, they wound up pleading guilty, you know, to minor charges. And how did you feel about the the settlement at the time? I I, I can't remember how I reacted. So, um, yeah, I think you're also. I think we're also and it's, getting tired. Yeah. And it showed how overblown the whole charges were to begin with when. In the midst of the strike, felony, 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 felony. Yeah, well, this one more thing should be on the record. Yeah. I, you all might do another session with her, but 
-huh. He did. Uh, he was always doing strike support. Uh -huh. And I remember this one big benefit concert, and I think it's before the Preston strike, uh -huh. but I'm not sure. I already met her, but I went to this benefit, it was at GW, the Lisner Auditorium or something like that, and the, a couple of um, Antioch Law students, Griff and Cliff and some other people, had organized this <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. rally for the Brookside Miners, I think it was. And one of the people they particularly thanked from the stage for all the organizing work was Fighting Herb Riskin. Fighting Herb Riskin. And that moniker <laughs> stayed for the next... 40 years. Yeah, yep. That's you. In fact, he has it on his sweater there, I think. It's a little... <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> no, that's for, uh, that's for sure. Well, well, just thank you for this, and thank you for all your yes. 80 years, almost, of, uh, of activism. You know, you have... You may have more things because there's the whole yeah, Rainbow Coalition, which is more 80s, I guess. Yes. Yeah. But a lot of the Nic and the Nicaragua work is yeah, but yeah, right. Right. is 80s too. But their whole house uh -huh. became a storage area <laughs> for material aid to send to Nicaragua. Is that right? Yeah. Let me ask you one other thing. Did you become involved at all, like in the Henry Wallace campaign? And did you ever involve yourself in much in politics? Electoral politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, but I, I, I was not there watching. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. It came out, uh, I, I was in, in uh, Pennsylvania. The committee, I was on one of the committees, but I, I didn't play a, a very active part in that. You know, I participated in rallies and stuff, but. That was not my concentration. Yeah, that's then, what I thought. Uh, you know. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Henry Wallace. During during the the war, my my wife was very much concerned with um, USO, but the the labor unions here set up the, like their own U, USO and they entertained uh, soldiers from, from uh, uh, stations near here to, during the war, during the USO period. When I, uh, this is World War II. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 When, when I was doing some research on something else at the FBI reading room, just while I was waiting for them to read documents, I was leafing through one of the books that they have there publicly. One of the documents from around 1941 was warning that communist women were attending dances at the USO <laughs> and were trying to indoctrinate soldiers. And uh, it, was, it was all in a very, you know, dramatic fashion. Like, uh, this could pose a problem for our men's fighting spirit or something. <laughs> uh, so they, she was under surveillance even yeah. then, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> right. Suspect. Uh, yeah. Anyway, well, thank you.